Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Deep Learning Sessions Lisboa. Uh, we're resuming our meetups after this small summer break, and we are happy to bring you some exciting speakers. Here with us today, we have Rolof Peters, who is the CTO and co-founder at Overstory. And he's here to talk to us about how to move from the research framework to the production pipeline. Um, so before we start, um, I'm just going to tell you how this is going, going to go. So Hulof, our speaker, is going to present us his work for about uh, 45 minutes, and then we'll leave 15 minutes for answering your questions. So we encourage you to use the YouTube chat to post all of your questions during the meetup, and we'll collect them, and we'll try to address them all at the end. OK, so um, Hulof, is really a pleasure to have you here. and. Um, Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and uh, welcome to the deep learning sessions. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank Hi, you. everyone. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let's start. Great. Um, so let me first say it's an honor to be here. Um, That's the, the company where I'm the CTO of Overstory. We're actually used to be based in, in Portugal for the first year of our founding when we're still called uh, 23. Uh, and I know Portugal always still likes to claim us as one of theirs, uh, up to the point where I think this year we're even one of the running startups uh, for the, the next one. So we, we did move to, to Amsterdam a year ago, but uh, Portugal is still uh, quite strong in our heart. Um, so now that's out of the way. Who are we? Um, so this is an uh, overstory. So as you can see, we're, we're quite strong on the data science uh, part of the spectrum. Um, and so we are hiring. Um, so if you're interested in, of course, doing interesting data science work, uh, DevOps engineering work, or more data engineering work, um, feel free, uh, welcome to, to reach out. Um, of course, it's nice to know a little bit more what we're actually doing then. Um, so these are some of the, the companies we work with, some Portuguese companies there as well. Uh, and basically, what we're really doing is um, looking at this little thing, uh, artwork. Uh, and so this is really what satellite data uh, can bring us. Uh, in the first image of the Earth in uh, 57, when the first Sputnik satellite was launched, this also kind of brought to, to life the first image, the full image of, of our Earth. In, 1972, uh, and since then, that kind of Earth observation took off. Um, so we played ourselves in that tradition, um, but then using kind of state-of-the-art algorithms and technologies uh, uh, to work with that. So the, the, the topic of today is uh, bringing research into production. Uh, but before I talk more about that, let me just show you a little bit kind of what are the kind of things we, we work with as uh, Overstory. Uh, and so one of the things we're, we're very concerned about is that forests are currently only the half the size uh, they, they were uh, before the advent of uh, agriculture. And uh, deforestation is also one of the largest uh, sources of, of greenhouse uh, gases. Um, next to this, forests are also a major source of, of food, water. Um, they grow many of the products we use on a daily basis. And so they're also home to 80% um, of non-human life. Um, so even though forests only cover about 30% of, of the, the, the land, um, they're, they're a major source of uh, our survival, uh, essentially. Uh, another point uh, which, which is light on this is here you can see a picture of uh, fires going on globally. Looks a little bit more extreme than, than is really the case. Like wildfires are a kind of natural occurring thing. Uh, so a lot of these kind of red dots, um, not always a bad thing. They, they can sometimes actually renew. Uh, some of the, the ground. What has changed is that wildfires have become more intense um, and also have become increasingly more common, meaning um, flora and fauna can't really restore. And this is a major problem. So these are kind of two of the main problems uh, we, we, we try to tackle and we'll work at kind of solutions that can help with this. Um, so what's the good news? The good news is there's a lot of things we can actually do about this. Um, satellites are really a kind of major breakthrough in technology, allowing us to see pictures of the Earth. Um, here you see a picture of uh, the, the campfire in, in California, US, from uh, 
800 kilometer distance. Um, and you can clearly see that something is going on here. Um, the other thing with satellite imagery, satellites are like stocked full with different kinds of instruments. So from having just a kind of optical spectrum, which we as humans can see, RGB, um, there's all kinds of other spectrums, um, which we can use to um, look through clouds or, or delineate a particular fires or only the forest or vegetation. Um, and, and this means that we really can see um, what is going on uh, almost real time um, with kind of the increase of satellites. Um, one of the main topics we focus on, uh, and we'll, we'll show some examples of kind of some of the, the things we're developing is um, around power lines uh, and the fact that, um, as you can see here, this is the, the fact that we can actually model quite well um, for the whole of US kind of what is called fuel risk, which means we can kind of model not necessarily where wildfires will occur, because that's a very almost random occurrence, not completely random. I mean, there has to be like stuff to burn. So this is what you can see here, the stuff that can burn in the forest. Um, and then here you see an image of the kind of forest fires that have happened over the past year. And you see kind of large concentrations around California and, and here on the East Coast. Um, and so it actually gives a quite good indication of not necessarily where wildfires will occur, but what are the kind of high risk areas where we might want to look a little bit closer. Um, and then one other contributing factor is that vegetation and power lines interacting with each other are responsible for 30 to 50% of this total land area, um, which again causes a lot of CO2 emissions, a lot of people losing their homes, et cetera. Um, so basically just the fact that um, you don't really want to have a tree falling down on power lines um, because that's of course asking for troubles. Um, here we see a little bit more of what happened with pg &E. I'll skip that part, we, we move on to the, the interesting part. So satellite data, um, since I assume there's like, normally I would be able to, to see people their faces, but I assume um, there's a lot of data scientists in the room and we love data. So what can be more splendid than having satellite data, pictures of our, our earth growing every single day, uh, new snapshots being made, uh, increasingly more common, new satellites being launched uh, at different resolutions um, and also becoming more and more accessible for small startups as ourselves rather than only military. So it actually now becomes possible to pretty much acquire satellite data from any place on the earth um, at a multiple resolutions, uh, depending on how much of course you want to pay for it. So these are the kind of uh, type of images you can then see. There's different um, sensor diversity, different types of satellites. There's stereo imaging, which means you can do height mapping. There's even satellites that uh, can capture video. Um, and another thing we work with, uh, as just an example of the, the research part of that, which is called sensor fusion. Like how can you combine um, different data sources that are looking at the same uh, part of the world? So how does the data look like? There are some input data, of course. Here you see uh, high resolution satellite imagery goes all the way up to 30 centimeter, uh, where you actually can pretty much detect like individual trees. Um, other data sources is on the multispectral data, like next to just RGB. There's these other types of instruments. Um, so this is very useful for understanding things, the health of vegetation. Um, and there is also um, like more weather independent radar, which can also look through clouds, which is useful since a lot of the, the forests are always covered by clouds. Um, we can capture things on a, on a multiple uh, scale, so multiple days, and you can really see the kind of uh, things that are happening um, over time. And that means we can make frequent revisits. Uh, and then there's different types, as I said, input data from very low resolution on the left to more high resolution on the right. Um, so that's kind of the context of the type of data uh, we work with. And also the context when I talk about kind of putting research into put to production, this is the kind of elements we, we work with as data scientists. Um, and so with putting research in production, I don't mean like putting research, commercializing kind of academic research, which is a whole different field. If, if that's what you're interested in, you can look at um, uh, in innovation cycles and things like this. Um, so that goes around things like uh, patterns and whatever you might want to do with your research. Um, what I mean is more research and shipping a product. Um, so it's kind of, product-oriented AI company where 
does research come in when essentially what you want to do is solve major problems in the world? Um, and research does play a quite important element there, since a lot of the things uh, we do, we can take a lot of inspiration from um, existing research and existing products, but there's a lot of new things that have to be developed. Um, and so Applied Research 101, uh, we don't really have a better name for it. Um, so asking um, the right questions, first of all, is quite an important element. Um, I'll, I'll go to some of these points a little bit more in detail. Um, if I go too quick, like I, I talk quite fast, if it goes too quick, I know it's recorded as well, so you can always uh, look back to the recording, but do let me know um, if, if I have to slow down a little bit or if there's particular things you would like me to talk more about. So first of all, asking the right question, spikes, um, this is going to be preparation of work or pre-research, small batch size, um, about the point of metrics, what kind of metrics are important when you do applied research, um, something we call deliberate allocation, which is about how we allocate your time, um, which also ties into variable scope fixed budget, and then about how do you make the right batch um, and also validate your assumptions. So I'll go into these, these kind of points uh, now. Um, but one useful way of, of kind of thinking about different parts of the, the software cycle, in our case, that like research is, is part of, where kind of what you really don't know what works or what you want to develop, or if you have no idea kind of what the right um, solution for a particular problem is, that's where research is quite useful. Um, but there, one, one useful phase to look at different uncertainty levels. So if there's a lot of unknowns on the left, up to the point where there's more knowns on the right. Um, and research happens really on the point where you have a lot of unknowns, right? So that's why you call it research. You have to kind of find things out. You have no idea how to tackle this problem, so you're going to do some research. Um, data science or, or software development, or whatever, look, happens a little bit more um, if there's some stuff known, like it's just applying like data-specific scientific algorithms and things to it. And there's a little bit of research involved there, but there's also a lot of software development involved there. Um, more general software development, I mean, better name maybe would be web, web software development. This kind of defines a lot of things. And not, not everything is known, it's still halfway. Um, but it is a little bit more typical feature type engineering. So it's more an engineering problem rather than a, a more science problem. Uh, and then, of course, there's business development where the product is maybe there, but you're really sort of finding out the way how you can tell the kind of story about it or how you solve the, the right business problems. Um, and then the most known where you actually come to repeat all the business models, most of the unknowns are known uh, and you have something that can repeat a cycle and something that works. Uh, and you have a product market fit. Um, the, the model of kind of certain thinking about uncertainty comes from uh, a model that's used by Basecamp a lot called, called ShapeUp. So it's a nice, um, it's online, the whole book, you can read it. Um, and this is kind of their, their principle about thinking about um, software development mainly. So this book is very much about software development, but I think there are some important lessons you can learn for data science and you can apply there. If you think a bit creative, like a lot of stuff, maybe not so much, but there's some useful stuff in there. Um, so in theory, you have tasks, you do your nice Kanban planning, your Scrum, whatever, depending on the size of your company, maybe some story points, some epics, whatever you want to do. And you have tasks and you try to just check them off one by one. Um, in practice, tasks grow. So this is called task creep. Over time, because there are so many unknowns, like these are kind of the known tasks, but while you're solving the kind of known task, many new tasks are popping up. So your scope starts to grow. Um, and then that also your, your time needed to, to solve uh, what you're trying to solve. And that's a problem. This is why software uh, projects and research projects and also data science projects are notoriously uh, hard to manage and also always over time. Um, and obviously we're no exception to this. Like this is something that, that we just have to kind of work at and become better at, um, but it's not something you can ever really completely tackle. Um, and this is another kind of way of thinking about this where with unknowns, you're figuring out what to do, and at some point you have enough knowledge about what you really should be doing, and then you get it done. Very nice schema where reality is a little bit more complex than that, of course. Um, so back to kind of research development of product, um, which we can reframe maybe a little bit into this, like research development, uh, like research, doing the research, 
development where you use the research to actually put it through a development cycle to create an MVP. And then having some product and product market fit, which is kind of where you take the research into software development, into a product, into something which you know solves a real business problem for customers who are willing to pay for it. Um, so climbing up the hill um, starts then with asking the right question. Um, and asking the right question is really about, first of all, not really starting with asking any questions, but really finding a way where you do it together. Um, so first, understanding kind of who are the final users? Like, who for whom are you trying to solve this problem? First of all, is it a problem you just came up with and you think it's there? And can you validate that before you even start to do any research on this? So that's also about understanding the problem that needs to be addressed and solved. Is it really a problem at all? Like a lot of um, tech-driven companies and research just happens in the blind because you're very interested in it. And that can be quite good, right? That's not necessarily wrong. Um, it's a bet. So it's a very uncertain bet, right? You're, you're just trying to do something because you feel it's right or intuitively it's right. And that's mostly how things happen. Um, but then, of course, it's important to also delineate like, what are the potential risks and benefits of doing that. Um, and then once you nail down if there are actually final uses for this and, and find a way to bring this into a project really together with all the, uh, all the users and all the, all the uh, people who are involved in this, is then, can we do it? Is there enough data? Where does the data come from? So this is where more the typical data science part starts. Um, defining some criteria or metrics to assess the project. Um, and then quite important, what often uh, tends to be uh, forgotten is also not just designing on like a, a criteria or a metric, like something like accuracy, F1, or intersection over union or whatever, but really how will you share the findings? Like the metrics, um, and I should have said maybe a little bit about my background. Like I, I worked always as a computer engineer, but uh, and, and I have some. I actually, I'm double drop out there. No, I would say I don't actually have degrees in computer science, but I do have a degree in anthropology. So I always come also from the social science part, where actually really, you know, point seven, where where maybe quantitative metrics are not as important, but really kind of more the qualitative things. Which means, how do you actually share? the output of what your data science model is capable of with the customer, which is what the customer essentially is interested in. But how does it solve the problem? How does it look like? Rather than the metrics, the metrics are just kind of a proxy for that, which is kind of something quantifiable because that's just the way that machine learning works, right? You need a simple metric. Um, and then also, like, is it amazing? Is it really worth our time? Like, are there better things we can do with our time? Does it make an impact? Um, and then the output is kind of having an inspiring proposal. So out of this, you essentially have a pitch. Like you don't have anything else. You haven't really, you've done maybe some spikes, some ideas, but you, this is just kind of creating the plan, right? Asking the right question is about creating the right plan. Then you move on and you have a kind of intuition about what would work. Uh, and then before you really dive into like the, the whole data science thing, um, what I always love, what we, we love to do is what we call a spike. And a spike, um, it's like, I try to make it as bit intuitive as possible, but like it's quite a steep hill, right? So it's a steep spike where we have to climb a little bit because it's a little bit bumpy there. Um, and we can also call the R&D model applied research. The idea is like, what are the, the really big uncertainties and how can we bring the uncertainty down? So it's not really even about how we're going to solve this problem, more what are the big uncertainties around this and how can we make those things more certain? So what is the rough terrain I work on? What is the problem? How can I narrow it down? What is the minimal and really minimal solution um, to create? Like, what is the minimal thing I can get away with to get an answer to, to solving this problem? Like just a V1 or a V0.1. Then out of that, you can also say, what are the kind of things I don't really have to be doing, right? To create a first possible version of tackling this problem. Um, and then also think about the, the, the tasks that aren't really there, but might cause problems about uncertainty, which could be, you know, um, I don't know, it could be I'm working from home and I've slept crappily, or it's um, other things that can come up. My internet connection is bad and I know I'm on the move, or Corona makes us all work a little bit different, but like there's all kinds of things to think about. And then what is what comes out of that is you've done some pre-research um, you've nailed down kind of uncertainties. You, you've made things a little bit more certain. Um, and this is really not even applied research. This is just like pre-hacky 
this is like the most hackiest possible research you can do um, because you're not really trying to like write a paper or even get like a decent decent thing there, but just get nailed down, like make this previous plan into a plan with less uncertainty. Um, then, of course, you, you want to get to some product, but the preferred way of doing that is small patches, which means that you really want to map the development cycle. How are you going to address this? Um, and then especially, can you work along what is called like fixed time variable scope or sometimes fixed patch, which means, um, let's say like, for instance, the, the shape of method, which is more for software development, uh, has this six week cycle. So essentially you try to allocate your time in, in kind of six weeks. Um, and the only thing that's fixed is the time. Um, what can be changed, and then of course that means that product owners and things they have to give some, you know, some leeway to data scientists or software developers for that, is that they can cut down on scope. So once new things are being discovered and some of these new tasks pop up, like you're actually allowed to change the scope. Uh, and the idea is that people are very passionate about this problem and people really want to go and solve the problem. So it's completely fine to cut down like the unnecessary, like cut down like the animal to the bone, right? Cut out the, the unnecessary meat or whatever. Um, then the idea is to do this in a more collaborative setting, um, especially nowadays with remote work, a quite important principle like asking for help, which means that you're not just doing this on your own, but you're really trying to ask for as much help where you possibly can, which means sharing contacts in Slack, um, asking things early. There's no real need to have much backlogs. With backlogs, tasks really tend to pile up. So there's a lot of freedom, and it's a little bit more messy. Like that's like I think in a, in a Twitter message, I called it emerging the chaos. So it's a little bit more of a chaotic method, but you give people more freedom to actually, you know. So it's not about like really managing things. It's really about being able to, you know, get to the end results, however you are able to get there. Um, then it's important to have uninterrupted time. So um, the people working on, on what is considered according to this plan, like something shaped that, that makes sense, that, that people don't have to do too many other things. And that is also uninterrupted, like that you have as much time as possible uh, for this to can keep in the flow. And then afterwards, because it's quite an intense process, you also want to have at least some, some time to cool down, which is not necessarily to refactor, but it's really just to kind of cool down take the learnings, maybe do a retrospective. Um, and then one of the things why this method is not always much liked is, is all right, it's counterintuitive. It's like, oh, but what about the ideas that, that come up, right? What about the tasks when I throw stuff out of scope? Like I have all these amazing ideas, but shouldn't I put it somewhere? It's like, no, great ideas will come up again and again, right? So you don't really have to worry too much about that. Um, and then the, the, the one other important part is kind of what I, what I call holistic metrics. So these are the kind of metrics that you, you tend to work with as a data scientist. Um, but there's really many different ones of them, and they're all equally important. So the most common one is the quantitative metric. Um, and that's kind of what we're very much used to working with. It's kind of things like, not sure if you really can see all of this, but it's the, the F1 score. Um, so it's things like, how is the accuracy doing? Towards the, like for segmentation at least, or precision recall maps, right? Which is what you see here. Uh, also maybe plots, a little bit more like the plots here. You can see definitely there's some overfitting going on. That's quite useful to know. Uh, and then it's useful to have these things, not just at the end of a training cycle, but print this out like every single training epoch. So we use a lot of like uh, PyTorch and also FastAI on top of that. And there, there's nice functions. We also made it like more accessible to do satellite data type stuff. Um, so it's very useful to have these things that continuously printed out while you're training. Um, and then also having more complex quantitative metrics, right? Where you have like um, maybe precision recall curves for different classes you're interested in. And even if you don't use this as the loss function, or maybe you want to use it as a loss function, but you don't really have to make it complicated on the architecture side. If you just have a single F1 score metric at the end uh, on the bottom image, um, but it's still very useful to know how the model is learning over time. Are particular classes, you know, getting saturated? Are they, you know, is the precision recall curve increasing? Like, on, on not just a, like a, a global level, but also on a kind of more class uh, level. We have multiple classes now to work with. Um, then uh, next to that, we also the qualitative things. So here you see an image of some image, like satellite, a little patch of satellite images. 
Now we have some predictions on which the labels. Labels are quite inaccurate here, but you can see there, look, highlighted wise, it does make sense. So that's quite useful to know. So at this point, we already know that whatever we're training here, that the predictions are having learned at least something more of the context than the original labels, which is a good thing. And you want to know this continuously while training again, not just at the end, because if you do this at the end, you, you waste valuable time. And you also don't know where the model has learned. Like if you only have the, plot, the, the loss, you don't really know how this single like loss number relates to actually visually the predictions. Um, other things, you want to look at the input. So the top right, you have some input image where there's some weird um, line going on. So there's here some weird artifacts which shouldn't be there. Um, and then on the, on the bottom, you have like predictions, which we also want to run um, as often as possible, even while training, not just after. So we can see what's going on and we can compare epochs to each other. Um, I think I have some more images about this. So then um, one way to, to manage all of this as a, as a more higher level process is to think about data science. Like usually with data science, we really focus on the kind of the coding part of things, like maybe the model, the exploration, the data part of things. But still, I mean, if you're honest, like as data scientists, we love the kind of coding part. Like we know data is important and we have to do work with the data, but we don't really want to do that. We really want to jump into the coding part and solve the problem there. And that means that we're very biased toward that part. And it also means we, we still tend to spend too much time on that aspect and forget about all of these others, which is actually what makes um, a data science product, if you want to in the end have like a product out of this um, work, like all these parts have to, to work together. Um, and so we know the 80-20% split. There's also a nice image here from Crowdflower where they interviewed a lot of people on the data scientists, how they spend their time. And actually it's quite close to 80% collecting data sets, cleaning and organizing data. Um, actually, it's more of a 90% to 10 as well. Um, in this, the waterfall is still the standard method. Like we, we still call things Kanban. We still, we still call, we're all doing lean and agile. Um, but one way of looking how usually data science projects work is still in a very waterfall uh, matter. Um, and I'll show a little bit what I mean with that in the, in the next slide. Um, and another thing which really stands in the way of kind of good research and good data science is that complexity is kind of how we, but it's a kind of street cred, right? It's like our, uh, what makes us cool. It's like why most of research papers are full with mathematical equations while code might be much easier to read or um, why we, we tend to really refactor not just to make things easier, but refactoring in data science land often happens making things more complex. Um, I'm not sure if this is your experience, but this is like has been my experience working, uh, having worked also for a couple of other uh, previous startups and, and having run uh, being a, kind of a um, consultant for many data science projects uh, in different countries. Um, so we know the 80 to 20 per hand split, like a very simple ML pipeline. We have some data, we have some cleaning, we have some modeling. I mean, there's many other future steps, but this is the kind of 80 to 20 per hand split. Um, we know this, but do we really? do we also really work a lot on the data side? Because that's still where most of the, the gains can be won. Like it's usually not as useful to optimize the architecture a lot rather than just spending more time on the data. Um, and then of course, there's the deployment part as well. Um, so um, what, what I then call the kind of um, waterfall method for data science is kind of the following method. Like we start with a data source, we start with some data sets, then once we have that, we do some data processing. Um, and then we do modeling, which we all love. Um, and then once the modeling is done, where we spent a lot of our time, we start to deploy it. So it's a very linear process, right? Well, we all know that this process is much more back and forth. And if even if the cycle tends to be sometimes back and forth, the way we work is still with the assumption that we first start working a lot on the data, then on the processing, then on the modeling. And then once we have great models, then we deploy it. Well, it might be a much more efficient way of looking more at this like this, right? You have the first data part and you don't immediately create all the data. You just like work with as, as little data as possible as allows you to get some grasp of what this problem consists of. So this is almost like a dummy data set. It's really to be able to get kind of the skeleton in place. And then you get like really the least amount of modeling you get away with. So um, 
like the simplest model possible. It might just be a random forest, like fine, do that. And then deployment just means, can your colleague run it? That might be the first. And then I didn't have time to make a nice animation of this, but you just can imagine that like us, like an hourglass, these things just go down slower and slower continuously together rather than step by step, right? So that's maybe do a little bit more data work, a little bit more processing, then deployment before you really dive into optimization and modeling. It might be hyperparameter tuning and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of what I mean with more iterative pipeline based working rather than um, part of our type data science. And of course, it's part of a much wider process. Like there's all this other stuff, of course, with, with a more standard ML pipeline consists of. Um, some general question, which I would assume come up. So what about research then? Like, don't we do real research? Like, yes, we do, but not one week or no more. Uh, one week, no more. It also means that we, like research is never done. Like we wouldn't, like we have, I'll show some examples of some research we're doing. Um, we have, for instance, um, a project where we do some generative modeling, which means we can upscale satellites imagery to higher resolution, purely from low resolution imagery. Um, but it's not research that we want to have completed on, on its own. It's research which, again, we place in this entire pipeline almost before all of this. Um, and so it means we just want to have an MVP in place for that, a skeleton. Um, and we also only do it if we have a problem in place where we feel it can help solve that problem. So there's no research for research sake. Um, then like backlogs, like backlogs, I mean, all of this, like, let me just also just give you that. Are we following all of these best practices? No, like this is all best practices. I hope we get to follow really amazingly at Overstory at some point. Um, we are getting better and better in this. So it's not that this is like, you know, let's just do it. This is something you just have to be aware of and try to get better and better at. Um, refactoring, refactoring also is part of the usual work. Uh, my opinion, it doesn't really make sense to have specialized refactoring projects because there again, it becomes a project, right? Then complexities uh, comes in. So again, refactoring should only be there when it's really helps solve a problem. Of course, technical depth, like there's limitations there. Um, and the same with backlog tasks, which tend to pile up. So backlogs are generally not a very useful concept, uh, in my opinion. Then what about if, what's the stuff that supports all of this? Um, code is infrastructure, first of all, as well. Like all the stuff to do is actually to make the work for other people easier. Um, so it's not just that what you write as code as a data science is just to solve a problem or a project. It's also to create a pipeline that you can you know, the, the the pipeline is almost a product and the product is kind of just, you know, the thing that flows out of it as a result. Um, and so next to that, visualize everything. Uh, as I said before, some, some example of this is, you have some, some nice images here. Like this looks pretty nice, you know, you should do some training. The first epoch, you already have a one score of 26%. Um, doesn't really matter what is what here, but you can see there's something being learned here. Like here, we even have like some uncertainty plots, which is not so important to, it's part of active learning. Um, but basically just look at the predictions to the right and the input. Looks good, we keep training, um, but not something weird starts to happen, right? So the F1 score really drops down. You think, oh shit, I'm not sure what's happening. Let's just keep training. But if you would see this immediately visually, you could see almost like a, a gun generative at very serial network uh, might have like this kind of, where things go to crapper. Uh, and this happens with like with GeoNets or with segmentation models. It can happen as well, right? Because you try to downscale and upscale imagery to create segmentation maps. So stuff can break down. So something really bad is going on here with the, the prediction. Like, um, and then you think maybe it will come up, right? So it's back to 13%. But visually, you can see like this goes completely into the crap. Um, you really probably have to stop trading already now and, and do something about it. But if you wouldn't really know better and you just keep training, you think, oh, actually the F1 score goes better, right? We're now at 32% all the way up to 40%. So not only after you know, 28 epochs, you start checking it out and you wasted all the time uh, where you could just have this part, the visual part as part of the data science pipeline. Uh, and things would have been much easier. Um, so that's about visualize everything. EC is also a good thing. Like again, like complexity is great and it's, it's um, um, I like complexity, um, but it's not necessarily a good thing for data science. Like you want to actually make things as easy as possible. So one way we do this is like, we make it very easy to visualize satellite imagery for ourselves, for instance, even before we do anything with it. So here you can see just in a single line of code, 
We can see what satellite image is available. We can plot like some preview. We can see where, like what different tiles is called. Like you might have different imageries available from the same place. And we can just plot it as an RGB image very clearly. So this helps us choose the right kind of data when we, when we train. And we can all do all of this automa automatic as well. Like, of course, we want to automate this. That, that's not the point. But when we debug, this is how we want to debug, like visually. And all these metrics and things, they're just a kind of a helpful extra component to the visual part of data science work. And notebooks are a great productivity boost, like as part of making things easy. If you wrote a blog post about this as well, um, if you go to it's still the, the old name, 22 AI, or anyway, redirect. Um, but it's basically like notebooks uh, and BDEF. It's basically like you code while well, you would code in normal Jupyter notebooks, but actually you can build full Python projects from it. Um, you can just play around, create documentation automatically. You can have um, CI/CD pipelines completely created from your notebooks. And so notebooks become your, your first um, way of working. And that means the documentation, everything is in one place. And it's, again, very visual. Um, and it's also very easy to reuse um, and, and share and, and things like this. There are some complexities about like how do you do Git management, like version management with notebooks, because on the um, output, there's a lot of crap that's going on. But that's where NVDEF comes in, and it strips your notebooks and makes everything nice to, to do code management. Um, and so how we use this is one way. We have our nice repository called set data. Um, this is like a normal code repository, except as you can see, um, there's, a, there's notebooks. Then this one has another folder, set data, where actually this get turned automatically into libraries. You can just work with and import. Um, like what you can see here, um, like actual libraries. Um, then part of that, um, we also have, well, here's an example of some notebook code. So we can see there's actually documentation there. There's some unit tests. There's other stuff going on. Um, then from that, we actually create automatic documentation on Heroku as well. Um, so that, that's quite nice. Um, and then we also have CSCD, like through GitHub Actions, um, tests that are automatically run. It means you just run all the notebooks, and all the notebooks should automatically run. Um, I know data science sometimes have aversions to doing this, and this is just for the data science work, um, but it has like increased their productivity by quite a lot. So NBDEF, check it out. It's got how, how fast AI is uh, developed, fast AI. I only have a few minutes, so I'll race a little bit through this. So some of the deep learning techniques then we reuse is you know pixel-based segmentation, um, a lot of unsupervised methods. Um, we really look at this from research, experimental work, and production to have more of a iterative cycle. Um, some libraries that help us do this is, like I said, Jupyter Notebooks, NBDEV. Uh, we do a lot of documentation and Confluence, um, FASCI, other kinds of things. Uh, infrastructure is also code, like infrastructure as code. So it helps us with that. It's seeing the infrastructure also as a CI/CD type pipeline, um, having serverless things, having Kubernetes and Docker doing kind of parallel remote execution. Like this is more specific things for geospatial land where you have Dusk and X-Array. X-Array is kind of like a NumPy type array, but it, it's really great for more high dimensional data. Um, Jupyter Hub is kind of what our data scientists use to, to access all the work and collaborate together. Um, and this means that from, it's also all run in the cloud. So for more traditional project timeline, we still can think a lot about this kind of stuff um, and do a lot, like much more rapid work, um, have instant access to all these things because it's all notebooks and it's just accessible with the URL. Um, it also means that there's no much downloading since it's all in the cloud. We, we let the, the algorithms and the data are kind of there close to each other. Um, we can run things quite scalable. Things are built only by the time we use it. And things are very much reproducible through like Kubernetes, Docker, and stuff like this. Um, I'll skip this simplified pipeline. Um, so some of the data we, we have in-house, we work with them, like different kinds of ground truth data, different kind of satellite data. Um, and so what all this then brings, for instance, as an example uh, uh, project is, for instance, some high-resolution forest mapping, um, where we take many years of satellite data. Um, we have, for instance, for, the, for, for one project we work on, like we have millions of square miles of total area captured at different resolutions. Um, and this then allows us to apply um, and, and I haven't really talked much about this, but it's like really large scale inference. Um, 
also as an iterative process. So what we deliver, for instance, data products, we always try to have it iteratively, not just have like a final deliverable to a client, but give them multiple versions, right? And get really buy-in from the client, uh, almost as a change management. Well, so, so really having collaborative effort to developing whatever it is that we're developing together. Um, other things we do is where there's a lot of, um, I mean, you should recognize this image. This is Portugal. Um, so creating force maps from, from Portugal. Um, working on kind of um, like, like Portugal, actually like kind of small portion of Europe's landmass, but 20, 30% of the area um, that gets burned every single year. Um, so as you are very aware, uh, more than me in Holland, like forest fires are, are increasing in the density. Um, and then on the research part, like some of the stuff we, we do, which we then do as more this iterative process, we do a lot of self-supervised learning, which means we can, with unlabeled data, we can kind of do some smart tricks uh, on the loss functions to still create semi-labels. Um, like, um, uh, we do multitask learning. We have some active learning, which means we can label less data and we only label the data that's absolutely needed. And then we do sensor fusion, where we synthesize data and we can upscale. Um, I really don't have so much time, so I'll just skip to some nice examples. Um, so generative upscaling, for instance, where we can upscale the image on the top right, or on to the top left. This is just an example of input. This would be too nice. Um, so this example, the type of resolution. Um, it's the same part of the world, just different resolution, 15 meter, 30 centimeter. So we can use generative models to, to upscale one type of data to another type of data, and that looks like this. So you have this image which slowly you know, gets turned into this more precise image. Um, doesn't look like much, but if you compare them next to each other, you can definitely see the difference there. So this is not only useful for our machine learning models, but it's also extremely useful for um, being able to understand what data we work with, right? Because we can actually see more what type of vegetation this is. So we can see to the top there's some palm, to the right there's some palm, and we really couldn't see that uh, on this other image. So, so that's quite quite useful. We do some active learning, which means we have, um, I'll skip the details, but basically it means that you, um, you have limited data, um, you create some machine learning model on that, and then you use that model to get some probabilities or, or measures of uncertainty. What is the data or what is the part, let's say the part of the world where the model is the most uncertain of, and you try to acquire data specifically where the model is the most uncertain. And there's many different ways of doing that. The, the simplest way um, is just running dropout multiple times. So you just have these image multiple times of dropout installations. Um, and you just get like a measure of probabilities. Um, and you see the most uncertain areas to the right. You can't really see it, but I, I highlight them here. So here are some images, some little pixels that are most uncertain. So there's quite a large area, but these are the kind of areas we want to then you know, send maybe people into the forest and, and get labels. Um, another way how we can use this is actually um, using it for uncertainty for, and so we can get less data, we work with less data, like two factors less, but we can also use it to ensemble models. Um, so one example of this is for instance here, we can have multiple models that have different uncertainties and we can just weigh the models, um, just as a bagging uh, or ensembling by their uncertainty. Uh, and we get a much better prediction to the, to the uh, bottom right than the original one. Um, other things we, we were looking at is uh, we have some projects on this multitask learning, which means you can have multiple types of data sources from the same source, same same area, um, and different types of tasks. So it might be height mapping, like what is the height of uh, a particular forest, together with segmentation of land cover. Like is it a forest? Is it uh, urban? Is it agriculture? Um, and it would be quite complex to have very different types of tasks in a single model, but you can actually run it either in a single model or you can just create one um, backbone and just have multiple hats. And on the hats, you can retrain and fine tune. Uh, and that's quite a nice way of, of working with different types of really different, statistically also very different data. Um, yeah, so these are kind of the two towers of a network, for instance. Um, kind of at my end, so a little bit out of time. Um, this all, for instance, brings them to life this vegetation platform um, we, we have for customers, where customers can kind of view many different insights about forests and, and vegetation uh, for kind of like identification of risks and prioritizing vegetation management and stuff like this. So we do it for utilities, for railroad companies, 
for large forestry companies. We do things for NGOs, like the deforestation stuff. Um, so that's all kind of what I wanted to say. If you want to know more about um, doing useful things for the world with satellite imagery, um, I mean, the slides will be online as well, but there are some, some sources if you want to get started with that. Um, so there's a lot of nice open projects available on, on that as well. So machine learning for geospatial type data. Um, there's a great primer on machine learning help to talk about climate change, which you can just go to climatechange.ai. There's many different you know, literature studies and kind of things you could be doing. If you're more in the software development corner, there's climateaction.tech, which a lot of different web developers, designers, um, we're kind of working together with bringing ideas to light about tech and climate change. Uh, and again, this is us. We are hiring. So come join our team in Amsterdam. Um, currently all remote, relocating to Amsterdam post-COVID. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Olaf. Uh, it was a really nice uh, presentation. And uh, I was really interested in the cases uh, you showed. Uh, but first, uh, we'll address some of our um, of our viewers' uh, questions. So, from Andrea, we have: um, How do you validate the minimum product? How to know when it is sufficiently sufficiently valuable for an initial release? Well, if you have a target customer, or in our case, we we uh, we work with, with a lot of customers already, um, and, and building the product out is just a way of being able to serve more customers and doing that better. Like you just ask the customer. Like you just get them involved in the process and they will happily tell you. Uh, and you'll also find out that you're probably wrong about what is the, the main important things. Uh, and the project will change, but usually it also becomes easier. Like the project, we really start to nail down saying, hey, what, what is it that you really are interested in? How can we start with this? Um, the budget doesn't necessarily have to change, right? That's the amazing thing. Like you, you just try to really nail down what is the really important thing uh, that can help you solve with what we have in house. Um, and that's the minimal thing. Um, and the minimal thing is just getting to something that's good enough and then getting enough buy-in from the customer where you say, let's just start here, right? Let's do a proof of value or something. Um, we're, in our case, as a, like we're a small startup working with large enterprise customers. Like whatever we can do to make things easier, like we should jump at, right? So it means um, whatever we can do to, to get less complexity in the process from our customers, um, the easier we can actually roll out things uh, quickly, which also have a large environmental impact, which is for, for many of us very important. Um, yeah, so just basically just make things easier, but just ask your customer or do it as a collaborative effort. Okay, so uh, are you saying that uh, it's the goal may change uh, as you discuss uh, the product you're constructing for the client? I mean, usually not a goal, right? The goals, but but probably you'll find out that there's different ways of solving the problem you, you wouldn't have found out if you wouldn't have asked the customer. Okay. Uh, and then the other thing of iterative shipping, is you know, not something I, I mentioned, also means you get more buy-in uh, and you've got also more willingness of the customers to help you out with data or with other things that, because there's, like I said, there's so many unknowns. Like whatever you can do to just acknowledge there's many unknowns, um, and just have some way of dealing with that, that the better. So just you, you're just honest. You say, oh, there's many unknowns. We're going to tackle step mm -hmm. one, uh, and then let's look again. OK. OK, so next question also from Andre. He asks, uh, do you consider pipeline automation as an important step towards faster deployment? Perhaps with some predefined processing routines, model, uh, model boilerplates, auto ML, or online learning? I mean, I think it really depends on your, your problem as well. Like if you can solve things with just auto or not, like great, go for it. Um, like we use fast AI, as I said, a lot. Um, like some data scientists don't like it, it's too easy. But like if things, if you can make things easy, like why shouldn't you? Like my idea is like make things as easy as possible, right? So you have time to actually do the things that I need. Um, I, I think it's like, um, I also wanted to say, but like, I don't think you should automate things before you actually have solved the problem in a non scalable manner yourself. Like, it hurts a little bit more. Like, you have to go through the pain and you do things like that don't scale at all. Um, but then you've actually tackled the real problem in a very non scalable, messy, chaotic way, but more quickly. And you've learned a lot. And you have, a, like, you will know really physically, right? Like, what should be fixed because it hurts. Um, and then you go automating about the things that hurt the most. Um, 
Okay, so uh, are you saying that uh, it's okay to first start with uh, a solution that that you know that uh, it doesn't comply some of the requirements, for example, time and uh, uh, I don't know mm -hmm. things, and then you, you. It depends, right? So the requirements, like what are the requirements? Like can you can you scope down the requirements as much as possible, but still solving an important problem? That's more the question. Like you still want to do something that is actually amazing, right? You still want to deliver a really high quality product or a high quality project or a data product or whatever it is you're developing, um, which makes your customer exceptionally happy that they finally can you know solve this problem. Like that's still the aim, and you still want to do that. But maybe like in the in the case of geospatial data, maybe you can start with one area. Right, instead of tackling an, an entire country at once, or with a few areas first, maybe start with the simplest areas first. Um, okay. Okay, that sounds good. Um, we have another question from uh, Carl Desvid. He asks, any suggestion on code reviews for notebooks? Yeah, um, just try it. Um, it's basically like it's like any ordinary normal code review. Like you can check out the, the fast.ai repository online. Um, and uh, they use NBDEF, um, and so you can just check out how their notebooks are written. Um, but code reviews actually become much easier since the idea is that documentation is there as well. Um, and in our case, we have GitHub Actions and everything running. Um, and so we just use the usual, like it's it's like you write any order order normal code, right? So the code review review doesn't really change. Um, it just becomes a little bit easier since you have more context. Hopefully, and if it's not there, and certain things have to be addressed, you can just immediately add it in the notebook as, as documentation, as kind of headers. Or you can also have all kinds of visual. That's the other thing that you can have a lot of visual things in your notebooks, right? Rather than just looking at code, um, you can also see the output, right? So things are actually run. So you see the output of functions, not just the code. Okay, uh, and here's a question from me. Um, uh, you mentioned. Um, that uh, you can start working with a dummy data set. Uh, and when you had that uh, pipeline with the deployment at the end, you start small and then you uh, get more complex. So my question is, if you work with a dummy data set, um, how can you assure that your model will generalize well? I oh, mean, you can't. Yeah, you can't. Like, so the idea is you just have your pipeline in place first. And since a lot of uncertainty is about, now I have this great model. I only have two days left for the deliverable. Shit. What now? I have to do this for a country, for instance. And, and I mean, that's a, a real use case for us, right? So, um, so it's basically like, how can you have everything ready, like the skeleton? And for that, like, you, you just need the, the dummy. Like, it's not dummy data. Like, it's not different data. It's just a very small subset, but will definitely not generalize. Although, of course, you can just sample. Like, you can sample from a large area, but just like, I mean, maybe one hundredth of the data. Mm -hmm. um, and then just scale up, which also means you have a good baseline. So you have one, you have you have a baseline um, where you can then improve on because that's the other thing. Like within, without with, with, without starting to make things very complex with large models and neural networks and deep learning, like it's like like I come a little bit from the NLP corner as well. Like in, for NLP, our frustration was always when still deep learning was going great with computer vision um, in, in natural language processing, it wasn't really doing great yet. Like we had the problem that. Um, um, Back of words, which completely ignores things like word order, we could just couldn't beat it for many years, right? Back of words was just great, and it's such a simple method, and and it just because like yeah, if, if it works great and it's simple, like then that's a good baseline, and we should have that you know, in place. So for a lot of data we work with, things like random forests, which mm -hmm. you can only do if you have like very little data, um, are a great baseline. Like it will give some idea about the complexity of the data as well. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, we also have a question from Ivo Pinheiro. Uh, he asks, when developing a product in the industry environment, how can you make sure your company stays on top of the most recent developments in the area? How can you balance uh, development with research? I mean, do you have to? Like, uh -huh. if you have a problem that is currently unsolved, mm -hmm. like, that's it, right? Then solve that problem. And it doesn't really matter if, like what you use is state of the art or not. I would say do the opposite. Like go to, I should have shared this link in my presentation papers with code. I don't know if people know. I used to run um, a previous project called GitKive, G I T X I V. It's a little bit of a smart way of saying archive and um, GitHub. 
So they're basically just like um, code repositories of um, computer science papers. And that's what papers, uh, like ML papers for ML is basically as well, but much better. So you basically have all the state of your research there. You can compare it, there's benchmarks, and you have links to all the repositories and GitHub where you can just download it and use it. And you have a startup, right? Um, mm -hmm. So state of the art is there. So, I mean, research should be always um, solving a problem you're having, unless you're in academia, right? You do you do thoughts experiments, you do research, like there, there's place for that, uh, academic research. But unless you're like a really mega corporation or, or you know, Google, or Facebook, whatever, and you can take these bets and it's important for you. But if you're like a, a startup, like you really shouldn't be doing research. Like there's a lot of AI research, like a lot of AI startups like went down because they just keep doing research. And mm -hmm. unless it's useful research and someone maybe acquires you, uh, which also can happen, like there's cases like that, um, you know, when Magic Pony got acquired, they didn't have anything about research, which is great, right? They presented at some machine learning conference and, and that was it, right? And then it got acquired. Like if that's your aim, sure. But if your aim is building a product, like try to skip research unless you actually really have to, and then only keep it to like a, you know, a week or less. Okay, but um, you, how can you make sure that uh, um, your product, uh, um, another company doesn't have a product better than yours because they're using, I don't know, uh, more updated models that have more, uh, have, have a better accuracy or stuff like that? Or isn't there actually a problem? I mean, if one of the, one, first of all, if someone does it better, great. Like, let them have it. Like, then they can do it better. They should be doing it. And the other thing is, like, if you start with actually solving a problem, um, you will know much better how to solve it and how to improve it. Of course, you want to improve it, but you want to have at least, again, a baseline. You want to have something to start. And once you improve it and you have actually paying customers who will provide you with data, um, I mean, that's the other thing that is, that is hard to replicate, right? Data is still kind of the, the thing that tends to be the most proprietary aspect of all of this. Yes. Okay, so I guess we're done with the questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rula, for joining us today. It was a great talk. And thank you for asking, answering all of our questions. Um, okay, so to finish, um, I just wanted to say that the video will be available on YouTube and Rulof will also provide us uh, with the slides that uh, we'll also share with you. And we are just asking you to fill the feedback form so that we can improve our next uh, meetups. And um, there's also a form for uh, who uh, for someone that wants to be a speaker and wants to present its work. So we are encouraging you to fill the form. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Hulof. And uh, see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.